Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Christian Hoffman. He is Professor of Communication Management and Political Communication at the Institute of Communication and Media Studies at the University of Leipzig in Germany. His research interests include strategic communication management, financial communication, and political communication. And today we're going to talk a lot about political communication in the context of social media, new media, and stuff like that, political polarization. So, Dr. Hoffman, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. So, I mean, let's start perhaps with some questions about social media. So, what would you say are some of the benefits and opportunities we get from social media in terms of political communication? Sure. Um, I Maybe let me start with the, the observation that the question itself, I think, is really interesting because it seems that in the, in the past uh, years and months, we've been focusing very much on negative aspects of social media and dangers and challenges. So I, I appreciate it that you're shining light on the positive aspects of uh, social media as well, because I think there are very many positive aspects to social media. Um, you know, in, in economics, there's this concept uh, called revealed preference. And uh, it basically means that if we want to know what people really want, we should observe them, we shouldn't ask them. You know, if you ask someone, do you want healthy food? They will probably say, oh yes, of course. Uh, but then if you observe them, you might see that they're actually shoveling fast food into their mouths every day, uh, because it, it seems that in reality, they actually prefer, I don't know, convenient food or tasty food and so on. And so observing what people do really tells us a lot about what they actually want and if, if there's a benefit in it for them and should subjectively at least, right? And so I think the, the mere fact that social media are so widely adopted and so frequently used really already tell us something. They tell us that the, these media obviously um, give some kind of benefit to their users. Why else would they be using them in the frequency that they do? And uh, well, maybe these benefits you could argue are not in the realm of political communication. You know, maybe they're just entertaining or you know, they enjoy um, keeping in touch with their families and so on. But I would argue that there are also a lot of benefits uh, specifically in the realm of political communication. And uh, let me maybe try to narrow them down to three, because as I say there, I think there are a lot. Um, first, I would say, since these uh, platforms allow us to publish media content, basically whenever and wherever we are, we need very little infrastructure, basically just a smartphone. Um, that means that the sheer amount of data uh, that is being published has incre increased tremendously. There is so much information out there now, and there is such a high degree of transparency as well. So if we want to keep up to date in terms of what is happening in basically any corner of the world, social media are probably a very helpful tool you know, to, to get informed and to uh, tap into a variety of perspectives as well. And um, also the light that these media tend to shine on organizations and established institutions is also tremendous. I mean, it puts a lot of pressure on organizations to be transparent uh, and to create accountability in terms of what they're doing. So I think those are uh, really big benefits of these media. Uh, a second thing is that um, social media, of course, provide an avenue to public discourse um, alongside traditional media. So we still have mass media and we still have professional, jur professional journalists, um, the, the, these actors that we tended to call gatekeepers because they basically decided what we were able to talk about or what drew our attention in public discourse. And uh, of course, this is a very um, important and um, responsive um, uh, position, one full of responsibility. But, you know, journalists are human beings, too, and they're fallible and, you know, they are prone to biases as well. And so um, I think it's quite healthy that we have an alternative to traditional media in which just basically anyone who feels a need to address the public and to draw attention to, a, to an issue um, can actually do so. And so I think um, access to, to the public agenda has broadened and the discourse has become more diverse and more varied thanks to that. And uh, maybe a last and the third benefit I would mention is the, the networking opportunities that come with social media. So um, if you were a proponent of a specific political view, for example, or you were interested in some specific issue, um, and it wasn't part of the public agenda in the past, 
then you know maybe you would think that um, you're the only person who's interested in that and you would maybe self-censor or not talk about the issue because you don't want to offend anyone. So that's kind of what, what Elizabeth Nola Neumann was talking in her um, theory of the spiral of silence. And what happens nowadays, thanks to social media, is that we, you know, we can go online, we can look if there are other people out there and maybe they're not in your town or in your city, uh, maybe they're not in your milieu, um, you know, maybe you just are not in contact with them in, in everyday life, but these people are still out there. And so these media provide networking opportunities and they can foster communities. And I think these social dimensions are very important for political engagement. You know, it's much easier to become politically engaged if you feel part of a group, if you feel part of a movement and you have this social support to go out there and, for example, to demand change um, in terms of specific issues. Mm -hmm. So those are the benefits. What are some of the challenges posed by social media? I think that probably all three of these uh, benefits uh, also, you know, they have their, their light side, bright sides and their sh more shadowy sides. So they are probably disadvantages to almost all of these uh, benefits. If you think about the um, the uh, amount of information that is being provided. I mean, in fact, we do have so much information out there in the digital realm that it becomes um, overwhelming sometimes. You know, there's a danger of information overload. And I mean, that is why we're talking about big data and that is why we're talking about algorithm and algorithmic curation of information flows so much because, you know, we need to protect ourselves in a way from the sheer amount of data and information that's out there. And of course, these, um, these mechanisms that platforms apply to, um, you know, make these information flows more manageable, they can come with their biases. Um, they you know, can distort um, what is happening in the world just as much as journalists maybe can when they choose to report or not to report about stories. And I also think that the, um, I talked about the pressure of transparency that now rests on institutions and organizations. And um, I think sometimes there maybe there can be such a thing as too much transparency as well. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, we say we don't really want to know how sausages are made because it's, you know, a bit disgusting. And the same often applies to, for example, laws, right? I mean, you don't always want to know all of the specifics of how some institution is coming to some decision because sometimes it's it's not all that pretty, you know. And so um, I think that's kind of a downside of this this uh, immense transparency that we have that we maybe see a little bit more than we would like to, and that may um, endanger the institutional trust that we have, the, the, just this basic trust that we have that you know institutions are legitimate and that they are doing their job properly, um, properly. So I think that those are some downsides in terms of the um, information and transparency. And uh, if we think about this, um, this access to the public agenda and this broadening of the discourse, I mean, of course, the downside of that is that all kinds of positions and all kinds of opinions now have this opportunity to impact the public agenda. And, you know, we know from research that it's frequently people who are a little bit on the margins of the political spectrum who feel maybe dissatisfied with how the mass media are reporting on stories who feel this need to, you know, gain a voice and to make their opinions heard. And so I think social media kind of tend to draw more of the extreme, maybe more of the radical views and opinions. And so social media do kind of have this slant or this bias towards uh, opinions that can be a little bit um, beyond what most citizens um, think and believe. And they, if we just look at social media, we probably will walk away with a distorted impression of what the public opinion actually currently is. Um, and so what we are also seeing is that, you know, this, this immense diversity of the, the public discourse in social media then also tends to be quite confrontative frequently. You know, we talk about incivility, we talk about even things like, like hate speech, where um, just the, the discourse is becoming so heated and so controversial that it becomes sometimes quite nasty and uh, that may also be a downside. And, and finally, if we think, think about the benefits of, of networking and community building online, maybe a downside that's related with, um, to that is, is tribalism, political tribalism, with, which I think is very vibrant and alive and well if we look at how social media discourses uh, develop. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read in your work, at least in one paper, you talking about 
the phenomenon of Facebook escapism. Is that a challenge? Uh, what is it about exactly? Well, I think we're trying to talk about it in more of a optimistic sense because, um, well, um, escapism basically means that you uh, engage with media to withdraw from real life problems that you're um, facing. So, you know, you may have problems in your partnership or in your job or something like that. And so instead of confronting your problems, you are consuming media and those can, can be fictional media. You know, you can start binge watching Netflix or something like that. Um, but um, this concept can also be applied to social media. So maybe you start um, just endlessly scrolling down your timeline on Instagram, on Facebook or whatever, just, you know, to distract yourself basically and to withdraw from these uh, everyday problems. And what we were interested in is whether even this kind of behavior, which which kind of tends to be apolitical because, you know, we do, you don't really, really want to engage with very heavy topics or issues if you're um, engaging in escapism, if even that can lead to political engagement. Um, there is in the literature, there's a phenomenon called accidental exposure, which means that you are using social media for non-political purposes, but then you come across political content and you might actually become interested in that and you might become politically engaged. And I think uh, Facebook escapism is kind of an extreme form of that where you really don't engage with uh, social media because you want to change something, you want to do, th do something about your life, but instead you want to kind of withdraw. And uh, we find that even in these instances, we, we have the, these, these accidental exposure effects and people actually stumble across political content and become, uh, can become politically engaged. So I, I would actually, you know, from a perspective of political communication, I would say that that's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, this is a question I have to ask you before we move on in our conversation, because I think this is important to uh, make clear. So when we talk about new media, what are we talking about exactly? Does it include social media and other types of media or what? Well, I would distinguish between uh, traditional media in the sense of mass media like print and broadcast. And um, I mean, digital media, of course, includes all kinds of Internet sites, but I think I'm most interested in social media. And so uh, in that respect, I'm talking about what we could call participatory platforms. So those are platforms that basically facilitate the publication of um, of media content. And so we're talking about, for example, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and these kinds of platforms. Mm -hmm. Okay. So nowadays people are really worried about political misinformation, but is it a widespread phenomenon? And, and I'm now referring to both new media and traditional mainstream media. Uh, well, I would say the short answer is no, <laughs> but um, uh, I think in some respect, I may actually be a little bit heterodox in that respect. Um, and that's maybe also why you wanted to talk to me, but um, it really depends on how you define um, misinformation. And uh, I think that's, that's important to start with because um, a lot of the misinformation and disinformation uh, discourse that we're engaging in nowadays, which is a very lively research stream uh, nowadays, um, started with the fake news concept and um, I mean we, we were talking about disinformation misinformation long before there were even social media but um, I think you can say you can argue that um, research in these topics has really gotten off the ground since around 2015 and 2016 when we um, began to publicly engage very um, very critically with what is called fake news and uh, that kind of morphed into the disinformation and misinformation uh, discourse. And so maybe let me start by talking briefly about fake news or the concept of fake news, mm -hmm. because it's, I think it's really interesting if you look at the genealogy of this, uh, of this concept. And I would argue that the, the original meaning of fake news is exactly captured in the, in the term. It's, it's fake news. It's made up uh, news. And um, I think a, a key example of that was in around 2015 or 2016, um, there was this incident where a couple of young guys, I think from Macedonia, if I'm not mistaken, started this, um, this website, which kind of looked like a news website, but they just dumped all kind of made up stuff on there. And it was kind of sensationalist and was clickbait, basically. And it was a, it was a fraud. I mean, it was a fraudulent scheme in basically to generate traffic and then to uh, generate ad revenue. So they just wanted to make a quick buck 
And so they made up this, this news website and then of course they pushed all of their content through social media and because it was very clickbaity, you know, they, they actually generated some income apparently. And I think that is in a narrow sense, that is really what we mean when we talk about fake news. It is completely made up fraudulent um, news. But what happened then, uh, especially in the context of, course, uh, context of 2015, 2016, we are in inevitably talking about the Brexit referendum in Great Britain, and we're talking about the election of Donald Trump. And in that context, the, this um, discussion about fake news very quickly moved on towards fake news or exaggerated news or hyperpartisan news that, is, that was being pushed by foreign agents to interfere in domestic political debates. And so that kind of um, moved the discussion forwards from fake news in the narrowest sense to what is now called disinformation. So it's the intentional and purposeful spreading of misleading information. And again, the narrower sense of disinformation, I would say, is actually foreign interference. I, in, in that sense, disinformation is a tool in, in foreign policy and especially in the arsenal of uh, security agencies to kind of interfere in the political debates and the political decision making of um, foreign nations, right? And this, this form of disinformation is ancient. I mean, it's, it's almost as old as the nation state, maybe even older. Um, and of course, social media are a tool that, that um, agents can use uh, to spread this information. And, um, and as far as we know nowadays, um, there were some disinformation campaigns from Russia. There was this Russia internet agency, this troll factory basically, which spread disinformation to interfere with the presidential election in, in the United States. And so um, the, the debate kind of moved forward from this fraudulent fake news to you know, foreign interference with disinformation. But then again, this, again we, we kind of see this concept creep where uh, all of a sudden the debate started moving away from foreign agents to domestic agents. And uh, so now a lot of um, authors actually said, well, if we talk about disinformation, we also have to talk about domestic news outlets. We have to talk about you know, bloggers or people who um, spread social media content. And of course, we have to talk about politicians um, who maybe spread false information or distorted information or, you know, just plain lies. And so I think that is really a tipping point in the discourse around uh, fake news and disinformation, where all of a sudden this concept becomes incredibly broad and it encompasses potentially all kinds of forms of, of just regular domestic political conversation and political discussion. Um, because if we broaden the concept as much as, as, as we're doing now, a lot of normative questions are creeping into our understanding of what disinformation is. I mean, what kind of information is not entirely factual? What, what kind of information is selective or is biased in some sense or, you know, just conveys just a particular perspective on an issue. I mean, that applies to, I would say, 90% of political debate. Um, very few agents are entirely rational, um, hyper aware and informed agents that basically uh, can integrate the, the current state of science and discourse in all respects and then project them in a fair and balanced way. I mean, that's just not how human beings work. And so especially in the in the domain of politics where we are really talking about political ideology and normative perspectives on the world and how we want the world to be. It is just a plain integral fact of political communication that it tends to be, you know, limited, that it tends to be selected, that it's, and also that it tends to be persuasive. You know, we frequently we engage in political communication because we want to reach other people and we want to convince them of our point of view. And that's why we engage in, in debate. And so I think if we apply the disinformation concept uh, to uh, political um, communication from, from domestic agents, we are really reaching some you know, choppy waters here. And, and then the concept creep continues because then we move from disinformation to misinformation. And misinformation is misleading information that isn't spread intentionally. So it's not spread in order to mislead people, but still the information isn't entirely accurate. And so this includes just plain mistakes, basically, you know, or people are just not entirely informed about an issue. And so they just may happen to, to misinform um, 
the, the public discourse. And so I think we're, we're really in the midst of this incredible concept creep. And just recently, I'm, I'm afraid I forgot who the authors were, but I read a, a paper about the state of research on misinformation. And the, what these authors basically were arguing is that misinformation, you know, is just so much more than fake news in the sense of made up news or disinformation in the sense of foreign interference. But it's, you know, all these kinds of in, distorted um, political um, um, statements. And, and then if we want to really understand it, we cannot only look at foreign agents, we cannot only look at um, um, social media, but we actually have to look at the entire media ecosystem to fully understand, it, including journalists, including politicians, including mass media and so on. And so I think we're really reaching a point where misinformation research is almost interchangeable just with political communication research. I mean, what they're basically arguing is that misinformation is just about any kind of political communication. And I, I would actually agree with that, but my conclusion would be that if we reach that point, the misinformation concept just really isn't helpful anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that people have been focusing too much on this issue of fake news and political misinformation and that perhaps they are also exaggerating some of the effects it might have on people? Well, yes, I mean, uh, I think I actually didn't answer your previous question properly because you, I think you, you actually asked me if, this, if misinformation is widespread. And so I guess my answer is um, it depends on how you define it. Right. I mean, if you have this incredibly broad understanding of misinformation, then obviously it's widespread because basically any kind of political communication can be misinformation. Right. Um, but if you apply a stricter, more precise definition of fake news in the sense of fraudulent news, um, this is such a neg negligible um, phenomenon. I mean, you really it's a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult to find instances like these, you know, um, guys from, I think, Macedonia with, the, with this money-making scheme, uh, that barely happens, right? Um, and if you, if you um, also apply a strict definition of disinformation, we also find that this is not very widespread. I mean, what we know about the Russian interference in the American presidential election is that, you know, there was a couple of thousand dollars spent. It was really quite limited uh, amount of money that was invested here the reach of this um, content apparently was very limited and we have absolutely no evidence that it's convinced anyone to either vote for Hillary Clinton or for Donald Trump. And so, you know, I would say the state of the empirical research into this Russian interference in the, in the, in the Trump election really doesn't show any, any good evidence that this was a very important or even widespread phenomenon. And in the aftermath of that, you know, a lot of media pointed this out, this, this challenge and this problem. And so political agencies became active. And so there were a lot of studies. I mean, really this, this entire field research field into disinformation and fake news uh, has grown so incredibly in the last couple of years. There was so much money, public money, um, you know, um, private institutions, foundations who just kept, you know, <laughs> pushing money into this issue because it was considered this incredible threat to democracy. And so we, we actually have a tremendous amount of data and we have tremendous amount of studies which are very interesting. I mean, there's great research being done in this area, but they keep coming up with the result. I think that this is really not very widespread. I mean, there were a couple of studies on European elections and, and domestic elections in Germany, in France and in uh, in, um, in Great Britain and so on. And there's, there's very, very little evidence that there is a lot of foreign interference going on here. Um, and I mean, Russia keeps coming up again and again as the main culprit here. But again, you know, as far as we know, the reach of that content and the persuasive effect of that content is almost impossible to show, right? Um, so you really need to expand the, the understanding of disinformation in order to make the argument that this is a widespread phenomenon or that this is a widespread problem. Because if you, if you then expand the understanding of the concept to include you know, misleading statements by politicians or partisan journalism, for example, well, of course, yeah, sure, then this phenomenon becomes more widespread. You know, we do have, we, I mean, we have very many politicians who don't always you know, tell the entire truth. And, um, and, you know, political communication, especially in the context of political campaigns, is at its core persuasive. 
and it is in its in its core it is partisan and one sided you know that is that is what political campaigns are for and so i think it's kind of tautological to look at these campaigns and to look at the statements by politicians and then say aha see you know this this wasn't the entire truth and they actually left out this and they left out that and they gave a spin to what they were saying and so on and so on i mean yeah, obviously, I mean, if you have such a broad understanding of, of disinformation or even misinformation, then, yeah, sure, there, it is relatively uh, widespread. But uh, the more precise you are in your definition, um, I think the more you have to come to the conclusion that this is actually not a very widespread phenomenon. We, we have very little proof that it has any impact on our democracy. And so I am one of those um, observers of this field and one of the researchers who actually think that we are in the midst of a moral panic when we talk about disinformation and misinformation. I think that, you know, um, and I think I have to become a little bit political in, the, in, in my analysis of this. I think it is very telling that this research took off in 2015 and 2016. I think we had two major events that were just so disruptive and so disturbing to many observers, especially those in journalism and in the academia um, you know, who, who analyze and observe these political developments. And I think we were all caught on the wrong foot. And when we woke up the next day and we saw these election results or these referendum results, many of us were just plain shocked. And uh, so we kind of go into sense-making mode and we try to find out how, how that is possible. And I think um, we, we fall into maybe two traps. I think one trap is kind of a partisan trap. You know, we... Our, our initial reaction is to say this was a mistake. And so they, people who made this, this decision must have been misled in some way. They, you know, why did they make this mistake? Uh, instead of trying to approach this with a more balanced and neutral perspective and say, let me become better in understanding what the motives of these voters uh, were and why from their subjective perception, this was a rational decision. Uh, you know, I think uh, many of us instantly approach this with, with, a, with a certain normative perspective, right? And, um, and the other trap I think that we are falling into here is what I would call a rationality trap. Um, and that's maybe, maybe, you know, because especially as scientists, we believe in uh, rational processes and, uh, and approaching the truth and, and factfulness and so on. Um, that is kind of the framing that we apply here. And so we, we tend to look at this phenomenon as being caused by bad information, uh, misleading information. And, um, and I think th th that may be part of the problem, but it really underestimates the complexity of political decision making, which is a lot about emotions. Um, it's a lot of, about affect. It's a lot about... Um, social dynamics, groupishness, tribalism, and so on. And uh, so the rational aspect of that, I think, is really, is really quite limited. And I think th that is why, due to the, both of these biases, maybe, or both of these traps, we overemphasize the importance of the quality of information or the quality of misinformation and the, the, the danger it poses to uh, democracy when I think if you look at it realistically, as I said, political campaigns have never really been all that much about the truth and political communication is always about persuasion and selection and, you know, spin and misinformation, disinformation is as old as humanity. And that's not really all that new. And so, you know, I think that's that's why we kind of have this overemphasis on these uh, on these phenomena. And I don't know, we can go a little bit more into what the what the attractiveness may be of this of this kind of rationality narrative is that a lot of us tend to apply to these phenomena. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but just before we move on to other topics, let me just ask you, all of what you just said, does it apply to both uh, traditional mainstream media and new media? Or is it that, for example, in new media, uh, fake news and political disinformation and misinformation is more of a widespread phenomenon? Um, yes, I think that, you know, we um, do see that social media have their own um, dynamics in which information they tend to spread. And um, social media content tends to be um, quite sensationalist, I would say, you know, uh, clickbaity maybe in a, in a way, um, because 
because social media in a way are very honest. I mean, they directly show what our interests are, what attracts attention and, you know, what moves us to react in some kind of way, you know, thumbs up or some emoticon, you know, um, outrage, um, but also enjoyment, you know, humor and so on. So these media, these media are very immediate, very, very human in a way. And so I think it's not surprising that social media tend to be more like tabloids and a little bit less like broadsheet. You know, it's not really um, the, the pri it's not a primary platform, I would say, for high quality think pieces in, in journalism. In journalism, it's, it's more about, you know, emotional, you know, just bits of information that are interesting and engaging and so on. And so I think that makes um, social media a little bit more vulnerable to partisan use, hyper-partisan perspectives maybe, or to just sensationalist news items that are not entirely accurate. Again, I mean, coming back to this initial understanding of fake news, what, you know, these, the, these guys in Macedonia, I hope they really were from Macedonia because I'm bashing on Macedonia all the time. Um, what they were pushing out, this was just sensationalist nonsense. And I think, you know, there's a reason why this kind of works in, in, in social media. And we, there are actually studies out there that show that people are willing to um, share misinformation or disinformation content just because they find it enjoyable in some sense, even if they know that it's not entirely accurate, you know, they, they, they might still, they may still share it. And so I think that is why we relate disinformation and misinformation more to social media than to um, mass media. And then the terms of traditional mass media, um, you know, traditionally journalism has a lot of quality control mechanisms to avoid the accidental spread of misinformation, right? Um, but um, journalism is changing a lot in the digital sphere. I mean, their revenue models are just being completely destroyed by these digital platforms. Ad revenues is, is just sapped away, uh, and, you know, to, to digital providers. And so there is a, a cri an economic crisis in mainstream journalism, and that can re re result in a quality crisis because, you know, if you, if you don't have these ad revenues anymore, you have to let off people, um, you have less resources to spend on quality control, and so mistakes are just becoming more and more likely. So I think in, if we look more at traditional journalism and mass media, we, we do obviously have quality issues here. Uh, and also some media outlets react to this crisis by just becoming more partisan because they now have to rely entirely on subscription revenues and how do you keep your, your, your users engaged? You know, how do you keep them coming back? You know, you have to kind of entice them and the way to entice them to get them emotionally involved is just by becoming more partisan and more one-sided to engage more in activism uh, instead of just plain old boring both sidism journalism, right? And so I think in, in traditional journalism, um, we see to a, to a degree just the loss of quality and to another degree an increase in partisanship. And so again, if you have this very broad understanding of disinformation and misinformation is as, you know, not entirely accurate, maybe somewhat misleading information that may be put out there by intent, maybe in the case of hyperpartisan news outlets, but also maybe just by mistake because mainstream news outlets are becoming more partisan, um, then I would say you really do have a lot of misinformation in mainstream um, news as well. Maybe the maybe last point here is, I think it's a very fascinating if you look at the question, which users or which people are very susceptible to disinformation or misinformation or fake news um, and who tends to share this information. What you are finding is that it's used towards older users, uh, interestingly, instead of younger users. And so it's used towards users who are actually less frequent social media users and towards people who actually tend to rely more on traditional mass media on broadcast and, and, and you know, um, traditional journalism. And so I think it's quite fascinating that we associate this disinformation danger with social media when there's a lot of good evidence out there telling us that maybe that's not really what's going on here. Maybe we have a polarization problem, we have a partisanship, a tribalism problem that exists in the traditional media sphere, at least as much as in the online sphere. And there are even studies out there 
showing that um, users who are frequent social media users uh, encounter a more diverse news and media diet than those who are not as frequent uh, in their use of social media. So there is even an argument to be made that, that you know, um, social media is really not the culprit here and social media may actually provide some opportunities to combat the dangers that are associated with hyperpartisanism. Mm -hmm. That last thing you said is very interesting. So uh, does the concept of echo chamber, I mean, does it make any sense? Is that something that we really find uh, with high prevalence online? Um, well, I would say that, you know, when I, when I talked about the advantages of social media, I was talking about how networking and communities are really important for political engagement. And so I would say echo chambers are an integral element of political engagement. Um, if we look at which citizens are actually politically active in social media, and I have to say that's, that's quite obviously a minority. I mean, we're talking about maybe 30% of the population at least, uh, at most, sorry, who are actually you know, engaging in political self-expression. And then if we look at higher effort forms of, uh, of social media politics, uh, like, I don't know, signing uh, petitions, for example, we are looking at maybe 10% or less. So we're actually talking about quite a small segment of the population. And uh, what is the character characteristic of this uh, segment? Well, obviously they are very highly politically interested and, um, and that frequently comes along with partisanship. You know, if you are a politically very disinterested person, you probably do not have very strong views and you probably do not have a strong connection to a political party or to a certain ideology, right? And so uh, the reverse also applies. If you're very politically interested and very politically engaged, the likelihood is that you have a very specific point of view. And so there is a natural correlation between partisanship, tribalism, political information, uh, polit sorry, political interest, and political behaviors in social media. And so I would say echo chambers are an integral part of political engagement offline as well as online. Maybe offline is just a little bit easier to observe because you can just see, you know, there are Facebook groups or there are, I don't know, Telegram groups or, or WhatsApp groups and so on where people come together and coordinate and so on. You can say, aha, see, there is this tribe and there is this um, a group or this clique. And, but I think what that basically shows is that these, these media make certain social phenomena more transparent that we have always had in our society. And um, I think there's an important distinction between the echo chamber concept and the filter bubble concept. I don't know if you, maybe you've talked about that before in the previous interview. Uh, no, if you could explain it, please. Um, so the, the filter bubble uh, hypothesis, uh, um, Eli Pariser is very famous, he wrote a book about that, is that um, because social media have um, basically have this flood of information and data that I was talking about, they need to engage in, in selecting this content and narrowing it down so that the user experience is more comfortable, right? And so they engage, they use uh, algorithms to select content that you know, these platforms things think might be more interesting to you. And then the, high, the filter bubble assumption is that if, for example, you're a liberal or you're conservative and you um, tend to spend more time looking at conservative commentary or you like conservative commentary more frequently, then these algorithm, algorithms will be self-reinforcing, right? So they will show you more and more of this concept, uh, content and then they will push you into an echo chamber although you maybe didn't in, in, originally intend to be there. And um, this is a very controversial concept. I, it's, I think it's initially intuitively plausible. A lot of us who use social media will look at that and think, that kind of sounds like my experience of Facebook or Twitter, right? And also, whatever your position, political position is, you probably observe what is going on on Twitter or on Facebook and think, there are all these crazy people out there. You know, they are all stuck in these echo chambers. So there's a lot of what we call a third party effect going on here as well. You know, people always think there's a problem, but it doesn't apply to themselves. It just applies to everybody else. Um, and so I think that's why the filter bubble hypothesis is so plausible at first glance. But if we, again, if we look at the empirical evidence, there really is, isn't any proof as far as we know. And there are a lot of authors out, out there, I think of Exa Boons, for example, 
who just plain out say this is a myth. The filter bubble is a myth. It doesn't exist. There is no proof that algorithms actually push us into echo chambers. I mean, it's not very contentious to say that there are echo chambers online as well as offline, but it seems that really algorithms, again, are not really the culprit here. Actually, what we find is that um, users, especially politically interested users, self-select into echo chambers. They, uh, you know, make connections with people who are like-minded and they actually disconnect people from their, you know, network who are not like-minded, who are of opposing views. And actually, interestingly, what the research shows in the United States and also in some European countries is that this behavior is very prevalent on the political left. So liberals are more likely to, um, to defriend people who are conservative or who have, who have opposing views. And I mean, I don't really think that you can blame Facebook for that. I mean, if users just don't want to be connected to people who challenge them politically, then that's just a very human trait that we're talking about social phenomena like tribalism and so on that you cannot really blame on these platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, talking specifically about political polarization, because that's something that people worry a lot about nowadays. Is it that social media contribute to it or is it that society is already politically polarized and then in social media we simply get manifestations of that polarization? I, I, I'm, and I mean, assuming that political polarization is that big of a deal. So. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think the, the discourse about political polarization is very dominated by the American perspective. Um, as is actually a lot of social science research, of course. Um, and uh, so I think if we look at the American, the US case, um, there is quite good evidence that we see political sorting. Uh, so both political um, camps are becoming more, um, more pure in, in, in a way. So they become more politically consistent. So maybe in the past, you could have found a lot of liberals in the Republican Party. You could have found a lot of conservatives in the Democratic Party, depending on where you are. And this seems to be less and less the case. So uh, if nowadays, if you see a, a liberal or you encounter a liberal, you can uh, predict with very high reliability that this will be a Democratic voter. And the reverse applies to conservatives. So both parties become more ideologically pure in a sense. And this, of course, leads to, as I say, political sorting. And then there are a lot of interesting social phenomena like even geographical political sorting or, or political sorting in uh, professional fields where, you know, if you're liberal, you tend to live in that state or you tend to, um, you know, go into a certain political field and the reverse for, for conservatives. Um, but we have a lot of data about that, I think, from the United States and in Europe, for example, which is still West centric, of course, but in Europe, I think we have less proof that this applies as much because in a lot of European countries, we have multi-party systems. And uh, so our political system isn't, isn't divided as neatly as uh, the bipartisan, the, the bipolitical uh, or bi-party uh, um, system of the United States. So if, I, I mean, we just had an election in the Netherlands recently where at some point you really, you, you lose <laughs> the ability to count how many par the parties they actually have in their parliament. I mean, they have, I don't know, a dozen parties or so who have been uh, elected into the Dutch parliament and in Germany, we have at least five. Uh, and so, you know, there, there is, we have a multipolar political system. Um, that doesn't mean that some of these analysis doesn't apply. I think we have, um, is it David Goodhart um, who proposed this distinction between the somewheres and the anywhere. So we have a, a distinction between more conservative, traditional, rural voters who tend to be a little bit older, and we have these younger, more urban, more academic uh, voters who tend to be more liberal, and there is kind of a strong normative tension between these um, two sides, and I think we see very similar uh, phenomena in a lot of European countries, but that doesn't always translate very neatly into um, party political um, sorting, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I, my, my point is that uh, our, our discourse on political polarization is very dominated by the U.S. perspective. And if you look at the United States, um, there is good evidence that we see this political sorting. And beyond that, what we also see is that we have uh, more and more effective polarization. And uh, that means that not only are these, these two camps more neatly uh, sorted in a way, but there 
the, the perspective on the respective opponent is becoming more and more negative. So if you ask Republicans if they consider Democrats a threat to the well-being of the American nation, a shocking amount of Republicans would agree. And so, um, and, and the reverse applies as well to Democrats. So, and also there are interesting studies that these perceptions of the opposing party are incredibly ill-informed. So if you ask a, a Democrat, what do you think is the political opinion of a Republican on certain issues like abortion and so on, they will come up with the more, most extreme and distorted form of radical conservatism that's out there, right? And I mean, that's not at all representative for the entire Republican party or the entire Republican base. And the reverse applies, of course, again, to Republicans. And so this effective polarization goes hand in hand with tremendous lack of understanding of the opposing view. And I think there's an argument to be made that social media may play a role in this, you know, with, um, but not again, not only social media, because as I was saying, traditional media are becoming more partisan as well in a lot of them. And it seems to be a successful business model for news outlets to be partisan or even, hyper, either, uh, even hyper-partisan, so um, very one-sided in their reporting to you know, gain traction and to gain attention and to gain ad revenues and, and subscri subscription revenues um, in particular. And so mass media play just as much a role as, as social media, I think, in this trend of effective um, polarization. Mm -hmm. And maybe actually one interesting aspect, sorry, uh, is also that there, there was a really interesting study by Chris Bale, who also wrote a very good book about it just recently, um, who examined, uh, it was an experiment and they programmed a bot on Twitter. And that bot basically spewed out partisan uh, content and they basically um, asked Democrats to follow a Republican conservative bot, and they asked Republicans to follow uh, a liberal uh, a bot. And um, the, the idea was that if you encounter more cross-cutting information online, maybe you become a little bit more moderate in your views. And uh, what I think what they found basically was that the reverse was the case. You know, if you're bombarded by a bot who constantly spews, um, you know, conservative content at a liberal that may, may actually lead to a reactance, as Festinger would say, and you become more firm in your previous conviction. And so I think there's an interesting phenomenon here where we tend to think that the problem of social media is echo chambers and partisan sorting. And maybe it's actually the reverse. Maybe social media are actually too transparent and too cross-cutting, and we encounter too much information from opposing political views. I actually have the hypothesis that we are not really used to the news environment that we encounter in social media. If you think about your life, your offline life, so to say, right? Um, you probably um, have a specific you know, political leaning and you are probably engaged in a job where a lot of people are, have a similar mindset to your own. Uh, so you are you know, in this relatively homogeneous environment, then you, um, there is selective exposure, so you tend to read newspapers who kind of affirm your political leaning, and then you probably also live in an area of your town where people are from a social milieu like you, and also they are also quite homogeneous. And so you, we tend to be in, in, enmeshed in these relatively homogeneous networks, and we don't really encounter radically different opinions all that frequently. And I think social media are quite different because as I tried to argue before, on social media, um, it is especially people who are very partisan and very politically engaged, you know, and very excited about an issue who become active and who start posting and so on and so on. So if, if, if you and I go on Twitter and we just look around at the people there and what they're, what they're putting out there, I would guess that we both come away with the impression that people are just plain crazy. I mean, you find the most crazy views and perspective out there, and you find you know views that you would never encounter in your daily life. And so you would you leave the social media with this this impression that you know the, the people from the other party and people from this opposing political camp are really radical and crazy. But that's just because the most radical and crazy people are actually active on social media, right? And so, and also we are not really used to being confronted with these really opposing views. 
So I, I have this whole hypothesis that social media, the, the, the danger of social media really isn't echo chambers. The, the, the danger of social media is that we're um, confronted too frequently with political views that are just very alienating to us. And I think that might actually be a contributing factor of, to this um, effective polarization that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Can we say that how people engage with politics online differs in significant ways from how they do it in their offline lives? Um, well, yes, I mean, um, from our studies, we know that offline and online political engagement or participation is very, very highly correlated. I mean, to a degree where it's almost indistinguishable. So it's, it tends to be the same kind of demographic that is politically engaged online and offline. There is one big difference and that's the age gap where you know, younger people tend to be more engaged online and older people tend to be more engaged in traditional offline forms of, uh, of political participation. But um, it is uh, usually tends to be people with a higher socioeconomic status, people with you know, higher levels of education uh, and of course people with, with high levels of uh, political interest and so on. And so, um, I don't really think it depends on the media so much as it depends on the person, you know, what kind of human being is interested in politics. And so if you are a person who is interested in politics, you will use um, whatever means are available to you. Uh, and so that applies to social media. But um, I think there's an argument to be made that political engagement on social media is a little bit different in that it's maybe more, um, more performative in the view, you know, political engagement always tends to be, you know, expressive, you know, you're talking about your political conviction and it also tends to be persuasive. You're reaching out to other people and you try to convince them to, you know, move, follow your, your lead basically to agree with you, to vote for the right political candidate or party and so on. And so it's always about putting yourself out there and, you know, reaching out to other people, talking to other people. And that is true online as well as offline, of course, but, Social media, you know, they provide us with a personal profile on which we can engage in a lot of this self-staging and this impression management. And so um, there is a really performative aspect to a political expression and political engagement in social media. And some like Evgeny Morozov have criticized this as, you know, clicktivism and so on. And, and um, as window dressing, basically, people just pretend on social media to be politically engaged when they're really not. And I don't really agree with that. I don't think that that's actually true because first of all, um, we shouldn't underestimate that political self-expression tends to be a major part of political engagement, political expression. And so, you know, why is that any different if I, if I wear a t-shirt or if I get to go to a demonstration or a protest and to hold up a sign or whether I do that online, you know, um, those are basically um, equivalent to each other. Um, and also we see that all of these behaviors correlate very strongly. So if you, you know, if you post political content, if you write about your political leanings, and if you try to convince people on social media, the likelihood is that you are also engaging on in offline um, political um, uh, participation or actions, right? Um, they, and I think an interesting argument is that we, that we see quite a bit of virtue signaling and moral grandstanding in social media. And I think that's something that's worth looking into where, you know, political self-expression is always a social phenomenon. If you look at it from um, symbolic interactionist perspective, it's always about how we are perceived by others and how we want to be perceived by others. Um, but maybe this, this is even enhanced in social media where we are just you know, desperate for feedback from our network and just completely aside from politics, we know that this is something that is really um, alluring to teenagers, for example, who use Instagram to, um, you know, to post attractive pictures of themselves that they're really asking or, you know, waiting for these likes to come in and they feel better about themselves if they get a lot of positive feedback. And this mechanism, of course, also applies to our political engagement. And so if we post a state, if we post a black square on Instagram to show our solidarity with Black Lives Matters and all of these, you know, positive feedbacks are pouring in, you know, that gives us a very positive emotion, positive um, gratification uh, emotionally. And so I think 
maybe social media are a little bit alluring to engage in these kinds of virtual signaling um, activities just for the kick of getting this, this positive feedback from our community. Mm -hmm. So uh, just one last topic. Uh, in trying to fight back against the negative effects of social media, there are people that say that we need more media literacy. But does that work and is it good enough? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> um, because if you look at the people who are said to spread a lot of fake news and disinformation online, uh, whatever, you know, whatever that may be, so probably we're talking a lot about hyperpartisan content, um, those people tend to be very literate. Uh, they have high levels of media literacy. They read a lot and they have a very diverse media diet. And so they are probably above average in their media literacy. And that doesn't keep them from, you know, posting this content online. And so I think it's, again, this is just, this is part of this, what I call this flattering rationalist narrative around fake news and disinformation. And I, I think I maybe nearing the end of our conversation, maybe let me come back to that idea where um, I think that the, the idea that we are these hyper rational agents that, you know, absorb this information and then come to rational political decisions. That's a very romantic view of how human being works. And there's a, a nice book by Jason Brandon out there called Against Democracy, where he says, uh, you can, our ideal view of the informed citizen is the Vulcan, you know, from, from Star Trek, you know, this polit the emotionally disengaged, hyper rational agent. But in reality, if we look at the people who are really politically active, they are more like hooligans. I mean, they are more like parts of a team and they, you know, they, they are very emotionally engaged and they engage in a lot of tribalism and so on. And so we like to think of our, ourselves as political agents as very rational when in fact there's a good argument to be made that we are not and that we are especially in a political content, we are not all that, all that rational. Uh, Jonathan Haidt in one of his book, books has this very nice image of where, um, where he says, the relationship between our brain and our guts basically is like an elephant and the rider on this elephant. You probably heard about that before. And, you know, our gut is the elephant and the elephant obviously is much bigger and stronger than the rider on it. And so the elephant, if the elephant walks through the jungle and he sees a banana tree, you know, he walks towards the banana tree and, and starts eating the banana. And then the rider on the elephant says, oh yeah, sure, of course, I always wanted to go to that banana tree and that was my decision. And so, so what we're frequently doing is that we have these effective um, emotional responses and then Carl Weick would say we engage in sense making, like ex post rationalizations of what happened. And so we tell ourselves these stories uh, about how rational everything is that we do, because I think human beings fundamentally has, have a need for agency and they have a need for, for self-efficacy uh, in the social cognitive theory. So we, it, it is a really depressing and frightening thought for human beings that a lot of what we do is not intentional. A lot of what we do, a lot of our reactions are just instinctual gut reactions, emotional reactions. And we do not want to perceive of ourselves as these emotional animals, basically. And so we tell ourselves these romantic stories about rationalism and rational thought. And I think maybe it's, it's academics that are especially prone to this bias, um, as I said before. And so we, I think this entire frame that we are applying to uh, the Brexit phenomenon to the Trump phenomenon really is stuck in this in this hyper rationalist trap where we are always looking for explanations that are based on the quality of information and the quality of our rational debate and so on when it's really much more about selective exposure motivated reasoning it's about um, it's about the elephant and not, not the rider, right? And, and uh, I should mention Hugo Mercier has a, has a great book, Not Born Yesterday, um, where, where he talks about how difficult it is to, to persuade people, especially by just presenting them with facts and information. And so I think all of these, if, if we misidentify the problem as, you know, there's just not good enough information out there or people are not finding the good information, then the next step is that we are coming to the wrong conclu conclusions. And I think media literacy is the wrong conclusion. That, that, that's just not the problem that we're talking about. And another one which I also always grapple with and which makes me uncomfortable in some circles 
is, uh, or unpopular in, in some circles, is fact-checking. I am really not a fan of the entire fact-checking craze. I mean, the amount of money and attention that is being poured into fact-checking is just plain crazy. I don't think we have an epistemological problem at first, uh, in the first place. It's really not that much about facts. It's about norms. It's about you know, gut reactions. It's about groupishness. It's, it's about tribalism. And that's why it really doesn't matter whether a, a statement by Donald Trump is factual or not. It does have zero impact on uh, the reaction that Democrats or Republicans will have to that uh, statement. Um, it's whether we are part of team A, a or ta part of team B, whether we like that guy or whether we don't, and whether we want to signal to our tribe that we are part of that tribe or not. And so, you know, um, I think uh, Michael, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, I think Michael Bang Peterson, he's a Scandinavian, um, doing great research in this realm, and they put out a really nice study showing how sharing fake news online is a lot about just signaling that you are part of the tribe, right? And so it really doesn't matter if, if there's a fact check on, on Facebook that tells you, oh, uh, this is actually not entirely accurate. Who cares? You know, this is really about you want to support your team. You're a hooligan. You're not a Vulcan, as Brennan would say. And so I think all of these analysis or a lot of these analysis and all of these attempts to grapple with this problem that are based on this assumption of rationality are just a waste of money. And so um, that's, again, as I say, and to finish with that, why I'm a bit of a contrarian, I think in these, in, in these issues and in these topics, I have tremendous um, admiration for, for uh, most people who, who work in this field and for a lot of this research that's putting, being put out there. But I really think we should be more critical about what we, how we define fake news, disinformation and misinformation and to be more precise in our analysis of um, how far spread it is, how widespread it is. I would argue if you define it precisely, it's really not widespread and it's really not much of a problem. And it, it's, there's really very little evidence that it's very persuasive. And so a lot of what we are arguing about is really beside the point. And in, in the end, this really leads to a misallocation of resources. If we, if we you know, waste all this money and all of these attempts to prevent a second Trump which are based on a misidentification of the causes of this election, then, you know, not only are we wasting this money, but we are also, there are opportunity costs. We're not investing this money in really understanding the problem and really digging down to the root causes. And these root causes may be less satisfactory. They may be um, a little bit offensive to ourselves maybe, and maybe we'll have to question our own assumptions a little bit more and, you know, maybe they're really not all that much about rational agency. And so that's, that's my hope. Maybe the listeners to our interview um, may take this away from this, uh, from this uh, discussion that, uh, you know, there, there, there are alternative views on this. Sure. Uh, okay, so let's end on that note. Just before we go, where can people find you on the Internet? Uh, we have a couple of web presences depending on the topic. There's one uh, for our more strategic communication research, which is uh, communicationmanagement.de or financialcommunication.org. And if we look more about the political participation research, um, our website would be digitalparticipation.org. Um, but the easiest way probably is just Twitter, where you can find me under at uh, or handle uh, CP Hoffman with two F and two N. Okay, great. So, Dr. Hoffman, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the show. Sure. Thanks for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing the channel for more than three years now and it is thanks to people like you that it's been running for so long and so if you like what I'm doing, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal, all of the links are in the description box of the interview and to consider making a pledge there, support the show and otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share, share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, and Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenius, 
John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Sam, uh, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B., Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Alan or uh, Al Orwitz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardos France, and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.